Good morning. We're glad you've joined us for the Sunday morning service of Tusculum Hills Baptist Church, a caring and vibrant church that offers God's help to all people. We invite you to join us now for a special message from God's Word from Pastor Paul Gunn. The title of today's message is <clears throat> The Healing of the Paralyzed Man. And this is found in Mark chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. In my message today, I've got several points. The first one is the high value of faithful friends. The high value of faithful friends. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even uh, outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing, him to, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. Well, in Mark chapter 1, we have where Jesus was baptized, and then he cast out demons, he healed people, and he, he taught uh, people. And then he went to a quiet place to pray. And by, by now, news of this incredible man named Jesus who had come on the scene, news of this man had spread throughout the land. And here we find Jesus back in town. And this time in a building that was so full, there was no room at all to bring in anybody, not even a sick person. Now, the idea back then of bringing a paralyzed man to hear Jesus would have been considered no more than a nuisance to anyone present. And that's really sad. Uh, the people back then did not have the American Disabilities Act. They really had no regard or not much regard for people who were sick, especially people who had uh, debilitating illnesses that typically they would not be able to overcome. And so it must have been full because no one bothered to clear the crowd so this man could come to Jesus. But this man had four friends. These four friends had heard about the healings from chapter 1, they'd heard about this incredible man named Jesus and they thought, if we can just get our friend to Jesus, he'll be okay. Now, I've tried to picture this in my mind. In the Middle East, they have flat roofs. And on a flat roof, somewhere, these men got their friends up on the roof. The scripture says they dug through the roof. I wonder who owned that building. I wonder if the owner was upset that his roof was damaged. You know, I wonder what the conversation was like for the four men. Hey, let's make a hole in the roof. <laughs> let's make it big enough that we can lower our friend to Jesus. Amen. And the gospel says that, the gospel of Matthew says that they lowered him through some tiles in the roof. So we really don't know about the construction of this building exactly, but what we do know is that these men did something that was unconventional. They regarded the well-being of their friend more than they regarded the well-being of this building. They regarded the presence of Jesus more than they regarded the owner of the building. And they just thought, if we can get our friend to Jesus. Well, of course, I do a lot of wondering, and I wonder why they didn't just wait until Jesus finished his teaching. And I think it's because earlier Jesus was around, he was in public, and then he disappeared. He went into a solitary place to pray and be alone. And then when he, when he showed back up, someone said to him, people have been looking for you. They decided they weren't going to wait until the meeting was over. They decided Jesus can do it, and we're going to put him on the spot where he has to do something. 
Well, we can speculate about why they did what they did for a long time. So here, here's Jesus in this packed room with this man in front of him, lowered on this, this pallet. And his friends wanted him to be healed and they knew Jesus could do it. All the people stood there waiting for Jesus to say the words. And what words were they waiting for Jesus to say? They were waiting for Jesus to say, be healed. But instead, Jesus said something else. Look in verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> well, but it was obvious this man was paralyzed. It was obvious that his need was to be healed. And it looked like Jesus had missed the obvious. Right? Now, imagine the four friends looking at each other. Well, we didn't bring him here to get his sins forgiven. We brought him here to be healed. And you see, Jesus took this opportunity to focus on the real need of people. And that is the spiritual need. The need to be spiritually whole. The need to be forgiven. Look at Hutch and Marilyn over here with China. And I'm sure you thought about this chapter many times. And you know what we know to be true? Well, Hutch stood up here and spoke last year about how, you know, he's living for the day that his daughter will speak the name of Jesus. But the important thing, the more important thing is that you know, I'm certainly not telling you anything you don't know, is that her sins are forgiven. And Hutch stood up here the night of her baptism and said, I'm going to help her. Well, it looked like Jesus missed the point, but he didn't miss the point. <laughs> so here we have the, the high value of faithful friends. Do you have faithful friends that get you through hard times? You ever had a faithful friend that came to you and said, I know you're hurting and I'm going to help. You don't have a choice. I'm going to be in your life. I'm going to be in your face. I'm going to pull you through. Last week, one of my um, Air Force friends committed suicide. And in the phone calls that I got this past week over it, some people said, I feel like we failed him. I feel like we didn't help him through a tough time. Never underestimate the value of being a good friend. Next, Jewish leaders questioned Jesus. Boy, they were experts at that, weren't they? That could almost be the, a point in every sermon about the Gospels. The Jewish leaders questioned Jesus. Look in verse 6. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, why are you thinking these things? And when you read Jewish leaders... What you have is the presence of the Pharisees and the scribes. The Pharisees were not priests. They were, they were an order of men who wanted to keep a nation faithful to God. And you see, the Jews were under Roman rule, and I believe that the, intent, the original intention of the Pharisees was pure. They, they wanted to be a visible reminder of the holy. They wanted to keep a nation faithful to God, but something went wrong. And in this order of men, pride and arrogance took over. And they, they focused on obeying the letter of the law instead of the spirit of the law. They focused on works instead of faith. And when Jesus came on the scene, Jesus really messed things up for the Pharisees. 
He wrecked their whole system. Under Jesus, their whole world was about to become obsolete. It had already become obsolete. They just didn't realize it. And numerous times, the Pharisees clashed with Jesus. And along with the Pharisees were the scribes. And this is a career field that's by all practical purposes just gone from the surface of the earth. It's not needed anymore. But in this day, the scribes were needed in every level of society. It was a highly respected uh, vocation. Each of you have a bulletin. In your pews, there are, there are uh, hymnals. There are pew Bibles. There are many Bibles here today. Imagine if all of those things had to be handwritten. That'd be a lot of work, wouldn't it? And so scribes were needed on, uh, with, with every level of society. Their jobs were very important. They were needed in government. They were needed with private contracts. Their work had to be flawless or they would have to look for other professions. And those who were really good at it were able to get higher level jobs. Those who were really good at it were the more educated. And if you had copied the same bulletin, or if a group of you had copied this bulletin, uh, as many times as we have copies of these today, what do we have, some 300 copies of the bulletin today maybe? If 10 of you had made 30 copies apiece from a master copy, you would know it quite well, wouldn't you? So imagine the scribes who had copied the scriptures or copied other laws, other traditions. They knew these things quite well. They were very knowledgeable of the laws of the law of Moses, and they helped develop the religious traditions. But Jesus knew what the Pharisees and what the scribes were thinking. They were thinking, this man is blaspheming the name of God because he says he can forgive sins. And then what did he say? Jesus said, he knew what they were thinking. And he said, which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? Now, don't you just love the riddles of Jesus? <laughs> we could write a book on the riddles of Jesus. It would, but it would be much easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven. And since that's something that happens on the inside where no one could see, no one would really know whether his sins were forgiven or not. But to say be healed means that something miraculous has to happen. That's on the outside for people to see. You see where I'm going with this? So Jesus asked the question, what is easier? To say your sins are forgiven or to say take up your mat and walk? Now, in reality, neither of these are easy. In fact, they're all impossible. Both of them are impossible outside of Jesus. And if you're Jesus, they're both easy. A common belief in this day was that God did not help sinners. Well, you and I would be in trouble. Another common belief in this day was that sickness was the fault of the person, that it was, the, it was caused by the sins of the person, or sickness was caused by the fault of the parent's sins. So we have a packed house. We have people very knowledgeable about the scripture. We have people who thought Jesus was blaspheming. We've got four men who brought in their sick friend. And we've got this sick man who was also a sinner. And Jesus who claimed to have authority over both sin and sickness. So we have the, the high value of faithful friends. We have the Jewish leaders questioning Jesus. And now we have God's vindication of Jesus. Look in verse 10. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive your sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. <laughs> Notice how Jesus calls himself Son of Man. Now, that's the first time we read it in the Gospel of Mark, but we'll see Son of Man again in many times. In Aramaic, 
this term, son of man, was used to refer to someone or somebody. Or, or it was also used as a term to refer to oneself. Like today I may say, I, me, or my, or mine. But in this day, in, in Aramaic, it was common to say, son of man. It would, be, it would be like me saying, somebody's ready for lunch. If I say somebody's ready for lunch, that means I'm only considering one person ready for lunch. In fact, I'm getting ready for lunch right now. <laughs> somebody is ready for lunch. Who's that somebody? It's me. So when Jesus said, when he referred to himself as son of man, he was simply saying somebody. But in time, Jesus specializes this term in reference to himself. And then it became his term. And today, if we say son of man or son of God, we ref we're referring to Jesus. Now, in this passage of scripture, we have the first of God's numerous vindications of Jesus. Those religious leaders that were thinking critical thoughts, the ones who thought Jesus was blaspheming, that waited to see what ha would happen, they saw it. If Jesus claimed to have the power to forgive sins and then he wasn't able to heal the man, it would have proven that he was a blasphemer. Jesus walked out where no one had walked before. Elijah was vindicated by God when he called down fire out of heaven, but Elijah did not have the power to forgive sins. And so Jesus walks out here where Elijah walked, but he went further claiming to have the power to forgive sins. The ultimate vindication of Jesus came when Jesus resurrected from the dead. Now imagine what would have happened had Jesus said, I have the power to forgive sins. Now get up, take your mat, and go home. And then nothing happened. Jesus would have been laughed to scorn. He would have been accused of blasphemy. The scripture says, everyone was amazed and praised God. Everyone. And if this everyone really means all, then it would include the Pharisees and the scribes. But in time, they would come to despise him. A few years later, Jesus would be accused of blasphemy again. And this time, he would be accused of blasphemy at his trial before the crucifixion. So they accused him here of blasphemy, and then later on they would do it again. So we have the, we have the high value of faithful friends. We, we have the Jewish leaders questioning Jesus. We have God's vindication of Jesus. And then finally, here's the takeaway for you today. We have an illustration of what Jesus can do for us. In our sins, we are paralyzed. We can do nothing about our sin. Doing better doesn't make us less of a sinner. Any more than a paralyzed man thinking about moving makes him less paralyzed. Just as the paralyzed man needed friends to bring him to Jesus, I want you to think about your past and I want you to think about that person who brought you to Jesus. I believe occasionally somebody finds Jesus on their own in miraculous ways, in unusual ways, but almost all of us have come to Jesus because somebody brought us to Jesus. The stories we hear from the Gideon speakers, for people who give testimonies, that they found a Gideon Bible and they opened up and read it. Somebody put that Bible there. Somebody paid for that Bible. Somebody, and in some cases, somebody fought the fight to get that Bible in that room or in that place. But we all have people who have brought us to Jesus. Think, I want you to think who that was in your life. Maybe it was more than one person. Maybe it was several people. Right now in your mind, I want you to thank God for whoever it was that brought you to Jesus. 
Did that come to you? Did the person come to your mind or several people? Now, here's the challenge for you in this year. Who are you going to bring to Jesus in the way that someone brought you to Jesus? You see, when we are dead in sin, we are so dead in sin, we don't know that there's a better way. And then someone brings us to Jesus. And then we realize that there is a better way, indeed, with Jesus. Our sin can only be forgiven by Jesus. He is the only forgiver. And Jesus specializes in forgiving sin. It's what he does. So, do you want to talk to someone about sin and the forgiveness of sin? Or do you want to go to the Savior who can forgive sin? Do you want to sit around and analyze the word forgiveness? And, and do you want to try to figure out how, how somebody can really forgive you of, uh, of sin, uh, the, the sins that you've committed? I've had numerous people to tell me in my office or on the phone and other places, God cannot forgive me of the, for the sin, that I, of the sin that I committed. God cannot forgive me. Well, he can. So the question is, are you going to linger and think and think and think and wonder and question how can God forgive your sin or are you going to meet the Savior? It's like somebody who's sick and doesn't want to be well. You know somebody like that? They just love to talk about their sickness. But people who want to go well will find a doctor that will help them. So, Jesus is the Savior. He's the only one who can forgive sin. Yes, he can heal bodies, but it's more important for him to heal of sin. Luke chapter 24 says this, Then Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So what I'm telling you this morning started in Jerusalem. Because somebody told somebody... And then we had the scriptures all compi compiled into scrolls and then bound books and parchments. And now I've got this Bible here with me today. It all started there, but people were faithful to pass it on. Jesus can save you today. Jesus can forgive your sin and give you new meaning and purpose. He can do it. Won't you trust him? And be like this paralyzed man who now had a testimony when he took up his mat and he walked out. Heavenly Father, during our invitation time this morning, I pray that you would be with the person right now who needs forgiveness of sin. Be with the person who, who, who feels this morning that they've committed sins that cannot be forgiven. Lord, we thank you that Jesus is the Savior. We thank you that he has the power to forgive sins because we would be helpless, we would be hopeless without him. During our invitation time, I pray that you would make it clear through the power of your Holy Spirit to those who need to come to faith in Jesus Christ. And in the silence of the moment that we have here, do you need to ask Jesus to forgive you? Are you already a believer, but you need to ask Jesus to forgive you? He'll do it. Heavenly Father, we give you this time and ask you to use it for your glory. In Christ's name, amen. Let's stand together. And Terry will lead us in our invitation hymn, and we invite you now to come to Christ. Or if you want to join us in this church, or if you have another decision to make, now is the time for that. Come forward.